In this session, we're going to be looking at systems analysis, ways of analyzing systems. Now, this material doesn't relate to your first assessment item, but will relate to your second. So as we start looking now at systems and how we can construct systems and analyze those. So let's have a look at systems analysis. In this session, we're going to look at the nature of systems modeling and systems research and how to create what's known as connection circles. Our first step in modeling various systems. So in the tutorial this week, you should come along prepared to discuss your understanding of systems thinking and systems analysis and how it can um, support your research into educational technologies. So first off, let's have a look at a little video clip on systems thinking. Hey Ned, what's this stuff called systems thinking? I hear people talking about it and they don't seem to make any sense. They're really giving me a headache. Well, wet, this Austrian biologist named Bertolin Fee figured out that there are times when one and one doesn't equal two. What the hell are you talking about, Ned? Everybody knows that one and one equals two, don't they? Wit, you spent your whole life learning how to analyze things, to take them apart, understand what the parts do, and then assemble the understanding of the parts into an understanding of the whole. Nick, as far as I know, everyone thinks that way, don't they? It's the scientific method. Everybody learns it. Yes, wit, everybody learns it, though there's a better way to think about things. What do you mean a better way to think about things, Nick? This analysis stuff has managed to get me, the whole life to this point. So why do I need to learn something else? Wit, there is another way to think called synthesis, where you ask what something is part of. You first identify the containing whole, of which it is a part. Then you try to understand the behavior of the containing whole. And finally, you disaggregate the understanding of the whole by identifying the role or function of what I'm trying to explain in that whole. What the hell are you talking about, Nit? You're giving me more of a headache than all those people talking about systems thinking. Nick, maybe you could make believe I'm not smarter than a fifth grader? Wit, there are certain things we just can't understand just by taking things apart. Like what, Nick? Well, wit, water is wet, isn't it? Yes, the last time I looked. And what is water made of, wit? Water is made out of hydrogen and oxygen, isn't it? And they are both gases, aren't they, wit? Yes, they are. But where are you going with this, Nick? You can only experience wetness if you study water as it interacts with the environment around it. If you take it apart and study it, you'll never find wetness. Well, Ned, this sort of makes sense, though. Are there some guidelines about how one goes about thinking about systems? Well, there are a number of habits of a systems thinker, though maybe we could talk about them tomorrow. In the meantime, you might find the discussions at systems. OK, so a little bit of an introduction to systems thinking. It's a different way of looking at things than you may have been familiar with. Um, we look at how various systems interrelate and that particularly is the focus of systems thinking, the relationships between elements of systems and between systems themselves. But it is substantially different to analytical thinking where we tend to break things down and understand them in more and more detail. Systems thinking is very much the opposite where we try to build connections up and the thing that we're studying becomes more complex as we look at how it interacts with other elements and other systems. Okay. Oops. So let's look at systems. It makes it possible for us to analyze and understand complex phenomena such as those involved in education. Education is very messy, it's very complex. Any social system is going to be very complex. And analytical approaches to studying social systems, such as a classroom or a schooling environment or university environment, have difficulty because of that complexity. So taking a systems thinking approach 
around research into educational technologies, as we're focusing on, can often provide us with a greater insight into how and what is occurring. So, in systems thinking, we go through a process of trying to understand things regarded as systems and how they influence one another within the whole. And in nature, we see lots of systems, ecosystems, weather systems, um, the climate system, and these all have complex interactions. Um, but they generally produce some sort of output and we can call systems being healthy or unhealthy. Are they working in a harmonious, balanced way? Or are they working in an unbalanced, unhealthy way in which certain parts of the system are in crisis and in, um, in states of uh, destruction? Okay, let's try another little video clip. Green, and both of them are pointing about good day wit nice to see you today good day to you too net what's on your mind today well wit remember that talk we had about systems thinking yes i do are you still thinking about systems thinking yes wit only i've come to the conclusion i'm not sure i know what is a system and what isn't a system can you help me understand Nick, a system is an entity that maintains its existence through the mutual interaction of its parts. And systems have emergent characteristics. Wint, why is it that after you explained things I'm more confused than before you started? You don't spend much time talking to humans, do you? Could you make it a little simpler for my people mind? Let me try it this way, Ned. Remember when we talked about systems thinking and we used water as an example? Yes, we talked about water being composed of two gases, but when you combine them what comes out is wet. Well, Ned, you can think about salt in the same way. Do you know what salt is made of? Yes, wet. Salt is made of sodium and chlorine, and both of them are poisonous to humans though. When you combine them the result isn't poisonous, and we use it to season food every day. Saltiness is what we call an emergent characteristic or property. Wint, why do you have to use such big words? I need to bring a dictionary next time we talk then maybe I can understand your words. It's not really that confusing that. Sure Wit, it's not confusing for you, because you already know the answer. Okay Net, anytime you take something apart and it loses its essential nature you have a system. If you take an elephant apart you don't get small elephants, you just get a mess. So everything is a system, right? Not quite everything. A pile of rocks beside the road isn't a system. If you separate the rocks from the pile, the rocks don't change. And if you break the rocks, you just have smaller rocks. So you see everything isn't a system, though most things are. Thanks, Wit. Things are a bit clearer now. Maybe next time we chat you can tell me more about the habits of a systems thinker you mentioned the other day. Yes, Nip. Okay, so that's a little bit more around the concept of systems thinking and how some things can be defined as systems, but some not everything can be. There are certain um, elements, and we call them objects in systems thinking, that are not, not amenable to becoming systems in themselves. But most elements that we work with particularly around human interactions and school-based systems and so forth, do allow themselves to be defined and explored as systems. Okay, so a system is essentially, or systems thinking is essentially a way of problem solving by looking at problems as part of an overall system rather than specific um, outcomes or events where we often focus on in analytical thinking and in other forms of research. But systems thinking is not one thing. It's a set of habits and practices within a framework. Um, but it's based on the idea that the various bits of a system can be best understood when we look at them in context of how they relate to other bits of a system. So looking at just one bit, let's say how students are learning French is one bit of a system, 
but there's a lot of other interactions and, and things that are related to that. How is their classroom environment? What time of year are they learning French? What's the system in terms of, of the, the time-based system? Um, are they learning it as part of a group and the interactions they have with the group? Are they learning it with interactions with a teacher and the system involving the teaching and the teacher? These are all interrelated systems that build out in complexity to better understand this item of learning French. There's lots of things that relate to that and can interrelate. Now, so far, you've been looking at various factors that are of interest to stakeholders, the various stakeholders of your educational organization. Now, they tend to form systems on their own related to the educational organization that you're exploring. So as we expand and explore systems thinking and systems theory, they'll form various elements of the system, the organization, the educational organization that you're studying. But there will be other systems as well, such as the technological systems within an organization. There'll be a behavior management or discipline system. There'll be a range of other systems that will also become important. And some of these we'll be looking at in our third module, looking at policy frameworks. But the idea is that we're starting to bring in all of these different ideas, and we're going to use systems thinking and systems modeling as a way of coping with all of these various aspects of the organization and of the transformation in terms of educational technology we wish to see within that organization. Okay, so it's a whole lot of related objects or components that form a whole. And it's very much a holistic approach to the identification of problems with various focal points within the system. So in particular, where systems interact, we often see problems arising, where a system might have a negative impact upon other systems. Um, and sometimes those interactions can also be opportunities where if we enhance and improve particular intersections between different systems, we can see much more significant change in terms of how the system works overall than if we simply address individual elements of the system. And again, we'll explore more about this in the coming weeks. Okay, so systems have structures, they have properties, they have behaviors and interactivity. Now, much of this will become more understandable as we learn about modeling the systems. And you're going to have to make a computer model of your educational system. And we're going to change various properties and behaviors and we're going to see how they interact and affect one another. Much as we would see a climate model or weather model um, interact with different weather systems um, to change an overall pattern of behavior in terms of the weather. And so we have various inputs and processes and outputs, and we can define systems as either being natural, managed, constructed, or digital. Okay, we'll explore some of these concepts in more detail later. So systems thinking is looking at things as a whole, how all of these different intersections interrelate, and we can analyze, sometimes we can analyze individual parts of the system and understand them in more detail, but it's very much in terms of their effect and impact on the whole system rather than just impact upon themselves. So in terms of defining a system, it's composed of parts. If it doesn't have any parts, if it's just a single entity, then it's not defined as a system. It can be a component of a wider system, but it's not in itself a system. Just as the example in the video was of a rock. A rock can't be generally broken down into smaller system bits that make up a rock, unless you get into quantum physics and things of that nature. But in the main, we can define a rock as an entity on its own. But it can definitely be part of a wider system. If we use it as part of a construction process, it may be part of a building system um, or a road transport system. There can be various ways of using that entity, that object, within a system. It might be part of a catapult. 
um, where it's the projectile that's launched, but part of a wider system involved with the movement of objects over distance through the air. So all the parts of a system must be related. If they're not related, then they form distinct systems. Um, generally, we can find some relationship if we build our model complex enough to include anything. The universe as a whole represents a system um, that encompasses everything. But in the main, we tend to break down and look at smaller systems than the entire universe. Um, an education system, for example, where a transport system may not directly relate to an education system. Um, but if we started looking at how students get to school, um, then we might start interacting with a wider transport system, but we don't necessarily have to. Um, and a system is encapsulated, it has a boundary. We, at some point, we define what the system includes and essentially what it doesn't then include everything else other than what we defined. So an education system can be very complex, can involve lots and lots of things, but it wouldn't necessarily involve um, the making of cars and how cars are made in terms of a car manufacturing system. That would generally be outside of what we would define as an education system. Now it could be included. We could have a, a workshop where students learn about making cars and we could then incorporate it in. But in general, we would define the boundaries of our system not to include those aspects. Okay, a system can be nested inside other systems. So that example of, um, say, of education again, within that we might have a classroom system of how classes operate. Um, we might have then in a, a system of learning for individual students, a system of teaching of individual teachers. Now, these subsystems would fit within a wider system, which would be the system of the school. Um, or we could take it more broadly and go education and include university and higher, uh, other forms of higher education and lifelong learning and other systems related to education. Systems can overlap with other systems and they can share elements. So an education system that looked at school education might have some overlap with um, a system that looked at tertiary education. There would be some similarities. Um, and it can receive inputs and send outputs to a wider environment. So our education system, one of our outputs are well-prepared students to go off into life and into work. And then they might get go off into a work system or a social system, a wider societal system. And in terms of input, we might have early childhood centres providing an input, what happens in the home, providing an input into the school system. And the system consists of processes that change inputs into outputs. So something happens within the system, from those inputs into the system, things happen, and then there's some output from the system. Um, if we take, say, a simple system such as a bathtub, we have inputs of water coming into the bathtub, we have outputs of water going down the faucet um, or down the plug, then the drain. And in between, we've got things happening, such as people bathing and um, scrubbing their arms and using soap and whatever else happens within a bathtub system. OK, let's have another little video. This one looks at the idea of a bicycle as a system. Um, and in this case, the bicycle is being used for multiple purposes. So think for a moment, what are the different uses you could apply to a bicycle? So a bicycle represents generally a form of transport. So what uses can we use a bicycle for? Try to think of a few. Now we're going to look at a little video clip that explores some other potential uses for a bicycle, in this case, in Africa.
Okay, so so we can see there that the bicycle as a system can be applied to a whole range of other wider systems. But within that, the bicycle itself could be repurposed in different ways. It could be used to generate electricity or to pump water from a, a well. Um, it could be used to um, power and move a, a Ferris wheel. There could be a range of different applications we could use that particular technology um, within wider systems. But within the bicycle itself, we have a range of systems. We have a braking system. We have a system to convert energy into movement in terms of the pedals. We have a system for gearing to um, make the, that energy conversion more efficient. We have a seating system to make the comfort levels different. We have a warning system in terms of the bells. So there are a range of subsystems within the bicycle itself as a system. And those subsystems can be different in different circumstances. Um, a road bicycle for um, racing along highways and roads is quite different to a BMX off-road mountain bike bicycle. It has different um, uses, so the systems tend to be different. Um, a mountain bike will often have shock absorbers built into the system. Um, the wheels are going to be much wider, with much greater traction. But, um, the tyres tend to be thicker and, and less prone to punctures and a whole range of things of that nature. But we have other sorts of bicycles as well. We have hybrid bicycles that are designed for um, use on pavements and sometimes on the road. Um, we have touring bicycles that are designed for comfort for going long, long distances. We have cargo bicycles that can be used to, for transporting goods. We have unicycles that only involve one wheel. We have tricycles that have three wheels. We have um, tandem cycles that can involve two people at once. We have cycles where you can lie down and or sit down on the bicycle rather than uh, be seated up high. So each of these change the properties of the bicycle system depending upon its intended use in terms of its outputs. Is it stronger? Is it faster? Is it more uh, comfortable? So these are the things we start exploring in terms of systems thinking. So in terms of one particular example around the brakes, the brakes on a bicycle is an example of a subsystem. Um, sometimes we want the bicycle to brake really quickly, sometimes not so quickly. Um, the different materials used for the braking system. Sometimes we have little rubber clamps Sometimes we have discs. There are a range of different ways of stopping bicycles. When I was young, sometimes we had a brick that we threw off the back on a, on a piece of rope to slow us down. Um, so there can be a range of different ways of trying to have the output that we would want to achieve, which is stopping the bicycle. And the bra a braking system would be something that we would then explore. So in the tutorial, come along with some ideas of at least one other system contained within a bicycle and the variables involved, the various elements of that system.
and we're going to discuss those different systems that you come up with and look at how they fit within a wider system of bicycles. Okay, now sometimes when we um, solve problems, we can cause problems. This is called unintended consequences, where we're trying to solve a problem and make things better, but something goes wrong and it makes something worse. Understanding systems can help us avoid doing that. Um, it's a way of um, examining different possibilities and exploring them, or if things do go wrong, trying to understand what has gone wrong and coming up with some sort of intervention to address that problem. So let's look at this particular example. I can find where it's going. In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria. So they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects, though. The first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasp that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without the wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. The biological half-life of DDT is around eight years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, and while they tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon, the Dayak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. This time, though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred courtesy of the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation. Okay, so that's an example whereby um, we didn't understand the systems involved. We took what we thought was a relatively straightforward, simple solution. There's a problem. Here's a solution. The solution should fix the problem. But it may then have other consequences. That if we looked at the systems involved and the interactions between the various systems, we may have been able to see the possible consequences as a result of such change. So in terms of systems thinking, that's fundamentally what it's focused on. So in teams, try to think about some other unintended consequences of the introduction of 
your educational technology. You're going to be introducing it into an educational organization. What impact may it have on other aspects of the organization or other systems that might interrelate with your um, educational technology intervention? So give that some thought and we'll discuss that again in the tutorials. But post your ideas onto Teams so that we can discuss that and you've got something to post onto Teams. Okay, so next what I'd like you to do is to um, read this particular text on the complex systems and educational change towards a new research agenda. Essentially, it's looking at how we can use systems thinking to support research and better understand what we're researching by better understanding the systems involved. Now we're going to get to an applied aspect of systems thinking. Next session, we're going to create a model of the system that of your educational system. But first off, we need to identify the elements of the system that are going to be important and how they relate to one another. And one of the most effective ways of doing this is through a tool called Connection Circles. So again, we're going to look at a little video clip. A connection circle shows the parts of a system and how those parts affect one another. It creates a visual representation of how a system works. Key parts of the system that can change over time are written around a circle. These parts are then connected with arrows to show cause and effect relationships. One reason this tool is so helpful in building understanding is that it creates a focus on the relationships among parts, not just on the parts alone. The simplest way to see the power of a connection circle is to show an example of how easy it is to create one. Here's one simple story with parts that affect one another. The first step is to read the story. In the late 1950s, the World Health Organization tried to eradicate malaria-causing mosquitoes in Borneo by spraying the village areas with DDT. Soon, the palm-thatched roofs of the village houses began to collapse. The predatory fly that ate palm-eating moth larvae, which fed on the palm fronds, had been annihilated by the DDT. The dead DDT-contaminated flies were eaten by lizards that were then eaten by house cats, which also died. Soon, the disease-carrying rats began to invade the dwellings. To solve the problem, the World Health Organization dropped cats into the villages by parachute. After reading, highlight key parts that can change over time. Write up to 10 of these around the outside of a circle. You may need to choose which parts you think are most important if you highlight more than 10. Drop arrows showing cause and effect relationships. For example, as the number of mosquitoes goes up, the instance of malaria goes up. As malaria rises, DDT is sprayed. As DDT in the environment goes up, mosquitoes, flies, lizards, and cats all go down because they're dying. Keep adding arrows showing other cause and effect links until you are satisfied that all important relationships are represented. After creating connection circles for a particular system, use them as a basis for conversation. For example, look for loops in the diagram, such as the one shown here. Mosquitoes go up, which increases malaria, which increases the DDT. The DDT decreases the mosquitoes, which decreases malaria. Of course, there are also unintended consequences, which then lead to even more disease. Another use is to compare how different people choose the elements and draw connections. 
Any given connection circle illustrates the beliefs or mental models of the person who draws it. Comparing circles creates an opportunity to broaden understanding. This is just one example. Create a connection circle for almost anything that has multiple parts affecting one another. For example, impacts of atmospheric CO2 on the ocean, interactions in a novel, or the effects of drought on the economy or the environment. Thank you for watching this short introduction to Connection Circles, brought to you by the Creative Learning Exchange. Okay, so Connection Circles is a nice simple way of identifying um, for cause and effect relationships and causal loops, which are the interrelationships between a number of, of those relationships. In your second assignment, you're going to be creating a connection circle for your organization. So we need to understand it a bit more. Um, so essentially, all the different factors are placed around the outside of the circle. Now, some of those will be the key stakeholders that you've identified in the um, last week using socio-ecological modeling. So you can place those around the outside and look at how various groups interact with one another. One aspect should be your educational technology. And what impact will that have? What impact will it have on students? What impact will it have on teachers? What impact will it have on the amount of time students take with their learning? Um, the quality of their learning? There can be a whole range of factors that you place around the outside of your circle that relate to your educational technology and to the organization that you're studying. So let's have a look at some examples of um, connection circles and how to make them. In your tutorial, you should come along with a connection circle that you can share. Um, you should have identified at least 10 elements around the outside and at least 20 connections between those various elements. Remembering one element can affect more than one other element. You can have the lines drawing between elements um, connecting a number of things. Uh, your educational technology, for instance, will probably impact a number of different other elements. Parents may impact students. Teachers should hopefully impact students. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different connections as you build out your connection circle and better understand the system and how various parts of that system affect one another. Now, these connections can either be positive or negative. Um, we're going to quantify these in more detail next week when we start building the models, but you can either use different colors or you can either put a plus or minus on the arrow um, showing the relationship between the two items. So if a change in one element, if it increases and it causes an increase in the other element, so let's say if we have an increase in the use of your educational technology, then we may see an increase in student learning. Um, we may see a decrease in student um, uh, truancy, value to attend school. Um, we might see a decrease in student um, inattentiveness. We might see an increase in student um, focus. It, so you can see how as one goes up, another can either go up as well or it can go down. So try and include those pluses or minuses or different colors um, to indicate that. Okay, so it's a visual tool to show the relationships between variables in an organization or complex situation. And when we build our connection circles, you should identify the key factors or variables around your organization and what are the cause and effect relationships between those variables. 
how they impact one another. Um, so you draw the circle on a piece of paper or using some software. You choose the elements from your organization and educational technology. And you should choose ones that are important to the changes in the organization that you hope to see. Um, and the SEM model has helped you identify some of those. Now, there should be nouns or noun phrases. So they should be, should be things that you can um, point to and say, this is something. A student is something. Um, their level of understanding is something. Um, they shouldn't generally be verbs. Um, as we go on and develop more complex models, we'll see the importance of that. They should either increase or decrease as a result of um, the, the object affecting them. So write your elements around the outside of a circle. Generally try to limit yourself to no more than 10. Um, there are lots of things that can interrelate and we'll learn about making subsystems and other subnetworks. But for now, let's just focus on the 10 main elements around the outside and look for those cause and effects. Find elements that cause another element to increase or decrease and draw the arrow from the cause to the effect, from the one causing the change to the one being changed. And label your arrowhead with a plus indicating an increase or a minus indicating a decrease. Or you can use different colors. And try to find all the major cause and effect connections. Now, some you might have hard data on saying this will be able to be tested and we can say this. Some might be just conjecture such as student enjoyment levels and things of that nature, but it doesn't matter at this point. Now, once you've got those connections drawn, you're going to look for where the arrows form a complete um, connection loop. Um, we call these causal loops. Um, the arrows all have to go in the same direction. So you can't have an arrow two arrows pointing at one another as part of a causal loop. So these closed loops of cause and effect are called feedback loops or causal loops. And we're going to be exploring those next week. But if you can try to identify five causal feedback loops in your model, that will assist. Okay, and share that onto Teams so that we can see the results of your wonderful work. So let's look at some examples. Let's say you're in customer service and you're dealing with unhappy customers, or they could be students and teachers, um, and your product could be educational technology. So we know that they've been complaining about how many bugs there are in the service being provided to them. And it may be students complaining about quality of their teaching um, or in a customer service environment, they may be putting in support tickets or requests for assistance or help. It may be the students in your class requesting help. That could be a measure of their dissatisfaction. Um, and in this example, we've been including more and more features to try to make the students or the customers happy. So it may be trying different variety of teaching approaches, exploring different ways of using pedagogy to make the teaching experience more enjoyable for our students. So from that basic story, we then put the main elements around the outside. So sticking with the customer um, uh, metaphor, we have around the outside some basic things that we identified from the description we had of the story. So one approach you can have of coming up with your elements to go around the outside is to try to write a little story about your organization and the educational technology you're introducing and its effects on the various stakeholders. From that little narrative, you can then pick out the key words, the nouns that are going to form the elements of your connection circle. So in this case, we have things such as new features, support tickets, customer satisfaction, response time, and bugs in the product. 
Then we need to look at the relationships between those elements, how they impact one another. So for example, if we have more unhappy customers, then they're going to create more support tickets, more requests for assistance or help or queries. The more tickets means there'll be a longer response time to address customer needs, which will make more unhappy customers. Um, so you, in a classroom example, the more students that put up their hands uh, because they don't understand things, the less time you have to explain things, which will result in more students putting up their hands. Um, and we call that a positive feedback loop. So we try to then introduce different approaches to make the customers happy. So one thing may be to have um, let students answer each other's, other's questions. So they have more opportunity to have questions answered um, and reduce the amount of times they get frustrated and reduce putting up their hands. And we call that then a balance loop or a, we'll get onto that next week. Okay, so in, in drawing that, we draw links between the various elements of our connection circle. So the more, as unhappy customers increase, the number of support tickets increases. So we draw an arrow and put a plus sign. As unhappy customers increase, um, oh, that's it, sorry for that one. So as we have more support tickets, as that increases, the response time increases. And as the response time increases, the number of unhappy customers increases. So again, we now have a causal feedback loop. But as we can also introduce new features, new ways of teaching in this case, as that increases, we should decrease the number of unhappy customers. So we draw a line, an arrow and a minus sign. But as we introduce new features, new ways of teaching, then there's probably more opportunity for students to be frustrated because they're having to learn new ways of doing things. So as the number of new ways of teaching increases, the number of frustrated or number of problems and bugs and things that go wrong in the lesson could increase. So we draw a line of a plus sign. And as we have more things go wrong in a lesson, then as that increases, there'll be an increase in the number of unhappy students. So we draw a line of an arrow and a plus sign. But that doesn't form a causal loop. Of course, we can see that we have two arrows coming together as part of that loop. So that doesn't form a loop that we can um, separate out and look at specifically. So the first one does form a nice causal feedback loop, but the grayed out one does not. Okay, other examples you'll find in the readings. The first one is on, do you want fries with that? Looking at a fast food restaurant and the various systems within a fast food restaurant and how we can identify the various interactions between those. And that will help you better understand some of the complexity of what these feedback systems can achieve. The other example is from a storybook called The Lorax, um, looking at the interactions of characters within a story and how they impact and affect one another. So come to tutorial again with your initial connection circle and having looked at those examples, and we'll explore and discuss what can be done with connection circles in more detail. So that's it for this week. And I look forward to seeing you in the tutorial.